All right, hello. Next up, we've got Marcus. Is it Erin Mueller? Erin Mueller? How do I pronounce that? Please correct me. I don't want to. Yeah, perfectly pronounced uh, my name. Um, I do not expect that anybody outside of like this German speaking <laughs> countries can pronounce it this name. <laughs> so. Well, we expect you to get everything right. So it's only fair like that. Except for the kids, right? <laughs> With my name. <laughs> All right, so um, Marcus is the founder of Savory Data and works as a project leader, trainer and consultant for data engineering, business intelligence and data science. He's an educated software engineer, graduated business educator and professor for databases and project en engineering and owns several Microsoft certifications. Marcus speaks regularly on international conferences and writes articles for well-known journals. He's the author of Self-Service, AI and Power BI Desktop, and co-author of Power BI MVP book. Currently, he works on his newest book, Data Modeling in Power BI. And in 2013, he co-founded Data Community Austria and organizes SQL Saturdays in Austria since 2014. For his technical leadership in the community, he was awarded as a Microsoft Data Platform MVP since 2017. If you're ready, I'm happy to hand over to you and let you start. Yes, I can. Yeah. Perfect. OK, yeah. Welcome everybody to five things you need to know when learning ducks, which is sort of things I would have wished somebody told me up front before I started learning ducks. So this is like a personal personal learning path, and I hope that this helps you to shortcut uh, one of the of the of the hard and painful things when it comes to ducks. By the way, thank you very much for having me for this conference and thank you very much for the organizers to set up a thing like this. I hope you found a schedule to catch up some sleep during the next, what is it, 48 hours almost, right? Um, so thank you very much for setting this up. So what is this, this important uh, five things? The first thing is that you should learn or should know or should accept uh, five different things. The first thing is calculate the columns that we have like Excel formulas. So if you're used to Excel and writing formulas into cells, you feel at home in calculate the columns. Uh, there's also a thing called measures. And it's very, very important that you early on distinguish those two things both calculated columns and measures are written in DAX. So sometimes it's really hard to distinguish them because like the code is the same, right? It's almost the same. The context, the evaluation context is a little bit different, but you write the same, the same functions, you write the same things uh, there. And it's very important that you know and accept that measures are filtered. I will come to details to all of those five things uh, later, of course. Then measures by default do not behave like Excel formulas. This is one of the hard points, but we can write measures in a way that they behave like Excel formulas, like calculated columns. The fourth thing is that the measures are filtered, right? Uh, point two, measures are filtered, but even as a tax author, I can control the filter applied to my measures or the filters applied to the report. So some values will appear or disappear depending on, on what, what I write as a DAX author in my measure. And the last thing is the most important part yeah, that those two things, calculated columns and measures are completely different artifacts. The only way to accept this, the, the easier it will be. And hope this, this talk will also like teach you a bit about those differences and help you in deciding when do I use calculated columns? When do I use measures? This is, I think, a very important uh, question, uh, and yeah, depends on, on on the outcome, of course, um, of your of your reports, what you're intending to do. Let's start with the first thing. So, what is DAX? DAX is an acronym for data analysis expressions. In former days, it was also called uh, data analytic expressions. It was born with Power BI for Excel. So um, DAX was not just invented, but was part of an add-on to Excel 2010. I not, not know how old you are, how old you are like in your business uh, life, if you ever worked with Excel 2010. There you could download an add-in, install it on your computer, and then you could use a feature called Power Pivot for Excel. This Power Pivot for Excel still lives in Excel because since uh, version 2013, Power Pivot for Excel was automatically installed as an add-in because Microsoft learned sometimes it's hard for business users to install extra things onto their laptop because IT doesn't allow this, right? So they started to incorporate the thing to, to Excel. And the same thing, we could talk about like this is this this Verde pack engine, or we could talk about Power View, whatever you, you call, call, call the things. The same things live 
Further on in Power BI, Power BI Desktop, to be more clear, and also the database part also lives on in Analysis Services Tabula. So if you learn writing DAGs and can control uh, your things in DAGs, then you can use them as well in Excel or in Power BI Desktop or in Analysis Services Tabula, depending on which tools or services you're using. I know this is an Excel conference, but still all of my demos, I will demonstrate in Power BI Desktop because this is what I feel at home. But everything concerning DAX, you can also repeat in this very same way uh, in Excel or in Visual Studio when you open up uh, your environment to, um, to write things in LSS Services Tabla. As DAX was invented very late, right? Because Power BI for Excel, I arrived at the market uh, to 2010. I'm not sure if it was already in 29 or a little bit earlier, uh, later, um, but it was influenced, of course, by the existing languages. So in Excel, of course, you have a really powerful language there is uh, where you write your um, your expressions to do calculations within a cell in Excel. And uh, the, the syntax is function based, right? You write everything as a function. You, you write the name of the function and put in parentheses, and then you can have a function as the result of a function can be again a parameter to another function. So you can like wrap uh, functions uh, around other functions. There is, I was told because I cannot uh, verify it my own, but I, I tend to believe it that uh, they did not lie to me that one, over 100 functions are not identically between Excel and DAX, but they share even the same source code. So it's the same thing. So if you think about a sum or an if or functions like this, they're very the same. Maybe you heard about SQL, maybe you even brought uh, a SQL statements like select something from uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's also the concept of relational functions that you have like relations between tables and you want to combine them. There's some relational functions available in DAX. Usually you will not use them so much because everything you do uh, concerned uh, relations, you try to solve in the data model. So DAX, uh, not DAX, but uh, Power, BI, uh, Power BI and Power Pivot and other services, blah, blah. Comes with a model view where you can, um, where can where you can describe how tables are connected. There's a filter a relationship in between. But you can add or change those where functions in DAX as well. And from SQL, there's also taking this row context where you write something like a select blah blah blah, and you write an expression, and this expression is evaluated for every every uh, row in your result set. And the same happens uh, with the row context in in DAX. From MDX, which is the language to uh, query cubes, classical cubes, which are nowadays called analysis services multidimensional. Uh, there you can write meshes. You can define a formula which is then applied on a on an aggregated level. So it's not applied on on different rows and then it's up uh, aggregated up. But you can write the calculation where you take the sum from there and divide it by the sum of this. Um, and this is very, very powerful. So this is one of the reasons why you have to learn DAX, because if it comes to calculations like this, where you do percentages or ratios, mostly if you divide something with uh, something else, then you need to write DAX measures. There's no way around. You cannot do this in Power Query. You cannot do this as a calculated column. You cannot do, solve this in the data source. There's also the implicit joins in MDX. You do not write select something from and then join it like you do in SQL. This is not necessary in DAX because DAX fully knows everything from your data model. So where we described that different tables are connected with each other, DAX know this, uh, knows this and then can apply those uh, joins for you without writing them with uh, every calculation over and over again. And there's something called a filter context. So if you calculate, um, if the, the uh, mesh is evaluated, it's, mm, it's always evaluated within a filter context. This means if I put a filter on a report uh, asking for only the year 2020, or I put like uh, a bar chart and they have the different product categories, then for each of the bars, the mesh is calculated separately with different filters applied. So all of them have a filter on the year 2020, and, every, uh, and, and each of them have a different filter on the product category. One is for bikes, the other one is for accessories, and so on and so forth. So that's the filter context. And this is also something different, which is not existing in the other languages, which is the context transition. We will come to this later, a very powerful concept, a very powerful thing, but hard to accept and learn in the beginning. So the context transition is about that we can, or DAX will implicitly sometimes, con transition a raw context into a filter context. I will talk about this later, but I just want to set up uh, these terms here. So, your brain can stop thinking about this and then uh, 
I will try to solve this hopefully uh, during this um, rest of the yeah, 40 minutes or so. And DAX is a language is used for many things. So we have measures, we have calculated columns. This is what we talk about in the next 40 minutes. You can also use them for calculated tables. I will not talk about them today, and I will also not talk, talk about role level security, even if it's very important, and queries. So all of them are written in DAX, but still they're different things, different artifacts, and they have different evaluation context, so to speak. So the syntax is easy if we can trust Alberto Ferrari, one of the two Siegel BI guys, but it's hard because it has a very complex semantic. So it's model based and um, you have some really like easy looking uh, 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 functions which do very powerful things in the back. And it's very hard in the beginning to know about those things because you just read a function in like calculate, which sounds like, yeah, something is calculated. How hard can it be, right? And then it turns out, oh, calculate, this is a very powerful uh, function. It does a lot of things behind the scenes and you have to, to learn about this. So why is DAX uh, very uh, similar to Excel? Because one have functions are similar. It's the same syntax, like an if is not a statement in Excel and in DAX, but we use a, a function call. So if as a function and then we have three parameters in parentheses. So the first parameter is evaluated. If this evaluates to true, then the second parameter is returned. If this does not evaluate to true, then the third parameter is returned. As easy as this. So if you use this to Excel, uh, you already understand how this if works. As you can see, there's differences still because in Excel we have this cell references, so we can refer to the cell B3. There is no cell in DAX because in DAX we have tables, we have columns, it's a database, right? And a database we don't have cells. So we have to refer to columns, like as you can see here, I'm referring to the column amount, which is put in brackets from the table states. So I tend to use the single quotes, they're not necessary in all the, all the cases, but for example, if you use a, a reserved word like date, there's a function called date available in DAX, then you have to put it in single quotes. So I tend to write them always in single quotes. Yeah, that this is like uh, some of the 100 uh, functions which are used, uh, use the same source code in Excel and in DAX. Um, I wrote them in, in bold, which I tend to use the other ones like, uh, uh, yeah, don't even know to a truncation or square root or sign or sound roundup. Not really. I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not doing like uh, normal distributions in, in, in DAX. I'm not using those uh, uh, functions, but if you're used to them, you can still use all your knowledge and apply it to, to DAX as well. So let's start for the first demo and define the first three calculated columns. So for the demo, I prepared a very complicated, no, it's a really easy uh, data model. So this is not the data model, this is a, a report where I show three tables, right? I have a date table starting at the 1st of January of the past year, and it's then going to the latest day of this year, I think, or the latest day of the next year, I can't, I can't remember, yeah. So latest day of this year, I have four products, uh, A, B, C, D with different product IDs. Three of them, 100, 110, 120 are sold over the course of three days. So we have the full sales tables on the four rows um, to make this easy for me to explain how things work, right? We can like, uh, we can calculate in our head what's happening and therefore decide if something is correct or wrong. That's the idea of having a simple data model in learning uh, ducks. And if I jump to this table foo, what this is what I prefer when I write calculated columns, we can see here that again, this is the sales table, right? For three different dates, we have this three different products, different prices, quantities, and total costs. And then I want to calculate something here. So I create a new column. Uh, oh, I just, ah, okay. I did a training yesterday, which, uh, was in in Germany, so I uh, spent everything, uh, turned everything to to uh, to German. Uh, I'm not sure if at the time to restart Power BI, so I think we have to live with this now. So I'm sorry for that. So I will translate it on the fly for you. This is new column. So Neuschbarte means new column. So you also learn uh, something not only about DAX but also a little bit of German here. So this is new column, and the new column it allows me to add another column here. So Sparte is column. I get this column in here and then I write something like I want to calculate the sales amount. The sales amount is if I give, have the price and the quantity, I have to multiply those two. So I take the price 
uh, and multiply it. No, it's not the function price. And I get this tool TP, uh, not tool TP, this IntelliSense here. And this is very important. If you write something in here and the IntelliSense does not show you uh, the thing, then it might be that there's a, a bug in IntelliSense, but most probably it's because something is wrong in your context, for example. We'll see later in a measure, we cannot just refer to a column. We have to wrap it in the function. And if I just start writing the name of a, of a column, it will not show up here until this ends. And hopefully it reminds me it's not possible to, to use it here. So if IntelliSense does not show up things, please do not continue writing, but rethink what's wrong with your formula, what's uh, first a misunderstanding here between you and ducks. Uh, and then we multiply this with the quantity. And as, uh, as soon as we press enter, we get this new column here uh, with the values here. So uh, th uh, 10 times 3 is 30, 20 times 1 is 20, and so on and so forth. So everything is nice and crisp. The same is if I add another column here, which is the margin. The margin is the sales amount. That's the column I just created. So we can just use it as any other column. It cannot be distinguished syntactically, syntactically from any other, other column in your data model. And we subtract the total cost from it. Total cost. So here we go. Then we get the difference. That's the margin. So this left over what we can keep um, from the revenue we get from our customers after we subtract the costs we have to pay to our um, so suppliers. And then we can, of course, also do another uh, calculation, which is the margin in percent or margin percent, uh, margin percent. And this is the uh, margin divided by the um, by the sales amount. So I want to have how much can we keep in percent of the sales amount? Of course, I would have to write uh, multiply uh, times um, times 100, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a percentage, but instead I can also just tell my uh, Power BI that this is not just a decimal number, but I want to format it as a um, uh, percentage. So everything is then calculated times 100 and I get this nice percentage sign uh, as a formatting option here um, on, on the right. So everything clean and crisp here, easy as that. So no surprise, you would have written this very similarly in, in Excel, right? So calculate the columns, if you refer to a column, always use the table name and the column name, and yeah, try to put the table name under under under, under sub um, a single quote. Sometimes you really need it. Sometimes it's not necessary. But I try to uh, do this. At least I try to tell you that I did it because uh, just in the demo I did not put it under under single quotes. The calculation of a calculated column is done row by row, which sounds counterintuitive, right? Because it's a calculated column. So why the heck is this calculated row by row? But the definition is per column, right? We have one definition per column, and this definition is then evaluated for every and each uh, of your rows in your data model. It's very important that you know that this, the content or the result is persisted. It means that the model refresh will take longer because after the data is loaded from the data sources, then again, the calculated column is evaluated for each and every row in your data model. So this takes some time and then it's persisted. It's stored in memory and it's stored also in the PBX file or in Excel or um, yeah, in memory as part of the of, of the of the model. So if you open up the Power BI file, it will take longer. The Power BI file will take more space in your in memory uh, and also the PBX file will be, will be bigger, of course, because of that. So in Calculated columns, we speak of a row context. It means that we can just uh, reference to the price because for each and every row, there's only one value for the price available, right? Makes sense. We, we evaluate everything uh, for, 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 for one row by row. And for one row, there's only one price, one quantity available. So we can just refer to this and multiply things here. We can also use these in a report. So if I jump back to my demo and uh, leave the, the model, uh, the, the data view, jump to the report view, and maybe I just use this one, duplicate this one. And here we have uh, the sales table again as a reminder. And then I put in from my data, I put in the date. Here we go, the date, and then I put in those 
calculations. We start with the sales amount, right? We had the margin and we had um, the margin percent, and we'll talk about this later. So the uh, sales amount for the 1st of uh, September is like 10 times 330 plus 20 times 1, because it's the 1st of September. So this is 50, this is right, right? And then on the 2nd of uh, September, we have 30 times 4, this is 120, and 100 times 5 is 500. The sum of this is 670, so everything is fine. If you subtract the cost, which we can see here, everything is fine again. I know the number should be 205, so everything is nice and crisp here. Why does this work? So, because we just defined define something in the mod, uh, in the yeah, in the table, right? The, the values. But why could we calculate the 670? Or, or knew that it should add up those values, right? For us, it's intuitive, right? It's, it's the total cost, or it's the it's the margin, or it's the sales amount. Of course, it has to be add up. What else would you do with those values? But this is this would be not not clear, right? Why it's doing this is because there's a thing called default summarization. And default summarization usually for your numbers is or for all your numerical columns, either calculated columns or any other column loaded from the data source is set to sum. Um, and we have different options here. We have sum, average, maximum, uh, minimum, maximum, and we can have a count that the count is distinct, right? So count counts all, all values. So if you have four rows, it's counting four. Uh, the result is four. The count distinct looks for distinct values for the column. So, for example, if I put to a count on my product ID, I get four rows, but four because I have four rows in my sales table. If I do a count distinct, it will tell me, no, no, it's just three different product IDs I'm using here. So that's different with the count distinct. In the visual, for some reason, I don't know why, we have three more options, standard deviation, variance, and median, which is not available in the model view, and count distinct and count are have a different order. So I believe there's two different interns have worked on these features, otherwise I cannot explain why this should be different or would be different. So if with this knowledge, if we go now back to our report and I add the margin percentage, then we will see something weird because I told you the margin is uh, margin. The margin is what we can keep after uh, the, um, um, after, after we subtracted the, uh, the cost from the from the from the sales amount, right? So the margin percent is in percent of the sales amount. So a margin of 109 would mean if somebody gives me 100 dollars or euros or whatever money, I can keep 109 of them. This would be sensationally, right? This would be like an awesome business uh, uh, thing. So if you know something about this, please let me know. I want to invest in this company because this is like printing your own money, right? We get 100 euros and we can keep 109. Wow, wow. of course the number is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because as I told you, for the margin percent, we can see that the, this default summarization is set to sum. Again, sorry for the German version, yeah? Sum, summe is sum. So it's summing up those three values. Of course, this is wrong. The question before we change anything here is, what's the right value? What, what should we show uh, here? So the margin in percent is the margin divided by the sales amount. And of course, I would expect that's then 205 divided by 670. So if I calculate this for you, so the right number would be, obviously we cannot trust Power BI, so I have to reach, have to, reach out to the calculator. 205 divided by 670 means 30.6%. Now we see 109. Maybe you have this idea that, yeah, of course, this sum doesn't make sense, right? We should change this, sorry for here, here. we should change this to uh, the middle bit, which is the average, right? Uh, then, but still, then, then we're closer to the, to the truth, but still it's wrong. It's 27, or uh, why it should be 30.6. So how can we change this? In a calculated color, we cannot. So luckily enough, there's another concept in Power BI, and maybe, you already get an idea what I'm up to. Measures. We can use measures for these things because measures can work on the aggregated values of your numbers. And I will recreate everything here, the sales amount, the margin, the margin percent as measures. Um, and then I will use and show if this improves anything in my model here. So for the measures, you can create them then anywhere. They're not showing up in the in the data view because they're not really part of the data table. So if I create something in here, maybe I create another measures here. So I can keep the same names. So a measure, 
I would have a sales amount as a measure now. And remember, the sales amount was like the price times something. And I told you if I use IntelliSense and something is not showing up, then maybe there's something wrong with my formula. And the, the thing is here, a measure does not really sit inside a table. I imagine a, a measure sitting like in front of the whole data model. If you look at, at all my tables, the whole data model, which is very complicated in my case, but if it looks at this, it tells me there is no just one value for the price. I know there's a price column in the sales table, but there's not just one value. So what should I do with these four values? Do you want to pick me the smallest, the biggest? Should I sum up the things? Should I put the average? Whatever. I have to tap tax. So there's no default here. So I uh, want to have something like the sum, for example. So I take the sum of the price, and if I put sum, it allows me to do something because it now knows, yeah, there's several values. And of course, I can apply an aggregation function on this. And I just see that I started with the wrong example. I wanted to start with the margin. Sorry for that. So the margin is like the uh, sales amount, which you already have in the table. But again, the same thing. I have to write sum and then the sales amount, right? And we put the sales amount in here. And the sales amount, the sum of the sales amount, divided by the sum of the total. Uh, no, I'm totally confused, obviously. Sum of the total costs, right? So this is how we can calculate the margin based on um, the values we have in the data model. Yeah, I think the order the order is important here. Uh, then the other thing is that I want to add also the margin percentage. So a uh, new measure. And the margin in percent. Most like uh, the margin divided by the sales amount. Again, I cannot reference the margin. I mean, I can now because there's a there's a uh, there's a measure here, but I cannot reference the margin in my sales table. Let, let's keep everything for the sales table. So I can write the sum of the margin. And I divide this by the sum of my sales amount again. And last but not least, could also have stuck previously. I'm not, I'm not sure why I changed the orders now. So sales amount I already have been here. So this is then the sum of the price. Uh, times the sum of my uh, order quantity. That's easy as this. And if you not jump back to the report, and I show now the margin in percent, not from uh, the column, but from my measures. And you can see there's a difference in the, in the icons, right? So uh, this is like a table with a sigma symbol. This means it's a calculated column. Here we have a calculator. This means this is a um, measure. If, uh, if I add this uh, margin percent now to my to my uh, report here, then we see like this weird number. So this is because I also need to change the percentage uh, formatting here. And now we see we get the 30 or 6 at the end and all the other numbers also correct. So if you're using non-additive calculations and the percentage is a non-additive calculation, right? If you have the same, uh, um, the same results of a percentage calculation, we cannot add them up in a meaningful way. You can put an average, but usually that's the wrong average because it would be an arithmetic average. It's not a weighted average by like the sales uh, amount or the, or the cost. So we have to first take all the margin, sum up the margin, then we have to take up the sales amount, add up all the sales amount, and this result we have to do the division on it. So the division has to be calculated also on the total. And this is what we can do with uh, a measure. Also the margin, uh, which is like a calculation, a minus calculation, leads to the same result. So if I uh, remove this uh, this wrong percentage to be able to, to compare those numbers. So the margin, I calculate it from the calculated table, uh, calculated column, or with the measure, there's no difference in calculations. So for this, we can choose either, either or. Let's sum up the, the measures before I point out the problem. I did not point out yet. So the convention for a measure is we usually do not write the table name in front of the measure, and the reason is because we want to see really clearly see that uh, that we're, we're talking about the measure. Fallout of the session. Yeah, we usually, usually write not at the table name and the measure as I imagine it like lives outside the table, uh, the, the, the whole uh, uh, the data model. We have to create a measure inside a table, but this had nothing to do with the with the with the with the syntax of the of the measure. So you can move the measures around in your model and 
and the calculation will re result in the same thing. So it doesn't depend on where, where you put it, where you pin it. It's just for the UI because some, 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 somehow we need to find the measures in our data model. So we have to like add and pin them to, um, um, to a table. Either put it in the, in the fact table or what I did is I created an extra uh, table called measures and then I put all my measures in there. It's depending on your end users, wh wherever they want to find or look for uh, your measures. Just ask them, do you want them in the sales table or do you want an extra um, measure? The extra measure table helps uh, for everybody who is used to Excel because in Excel, if you connect to a cube, all the measures are um, on top of the list, right? And then all the filters and dimensions uh, are listed. Uh, the calculation, because it's not per, it's not persisted in the data model, right? The calculation is done ad hoc. So for our margin, for example, for the three dates in the total, every measure was calculated four times for every of those rows, and again, uh, the same calcul uh, the same calculations then executed on the level of the total. The only difference is the filters, right? In the row where we see the first of the month. There's a filter on first of the month of the date. That's why the number we see there is different from the second row where we display the second of the month, which are different from the total. The total is not usually not calculated as a sum of those three other values, but it's calculated in different row context, uh, different uh, filter context. Sorry for that. Different filter context. This means in the total there's no filter on the date, so it's calculated for all the available dates. Here I only have three dates, right? So it looks like it's, it's, uh, those three values are summed up, but it's not. It's just calculated over all the available uh, rows, which happens to be the sum of the three tables, of the, uh, of the three rows, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's not done row by row. We can ask for it. We will do this uh, later, uh, later on. It's not saved in the data model, so you can add as many meshes as you want, and the Power BI file, the Excel file, will not grow in size. Because I mean, it will drop because it has to store the string for your formula, right? But compared to the data, you will not change, uh, see any changes in here. And as they are calculated ad hoc, when they are executed, they respond to any user interaction. So if you put, put a filter there or there, or use the cross filters, uh, the result of the measure, the measure is the same, but the result of the measure would be different because different filters are applied. So if you compare calculated columns and measures, in calculated columns, we speak of a row context. This means, remember, we can just point out one, one column, and this one column will have exactly one value when it's executed row by row. For measures, this is not available because the measure looks at the whole data model, and I have to write sum of sales amount, for example. But very importantly, there's a filter context applied. The sum of sales amount does not mean that it's always summing up the whole sales amount, like 670 is the result of the whole sales amount. No, no, no. It's only calculating for the available rows in the current filter context. That's why we see different values in, in every uh, row or every column or whatever, or every bar, uh, whatever you, you put on your uh, visualizations, right? But sometimes we need the measures also to behave like an Excel formula, which we will see in uh, the uh, in the sales amount measure. So there's a, a problem I did not show you in my sales amount measure. Maybe I remove the, the margins here and then we can compare those two values. So remember, three dates, the sales amount, we already said, yes, this is the right number. And then we see some of the numbers are the same, but others are different, which is way higher. And it's like totally lost here in the total. It would be really good, yeah, gesamt is total, uh, another German word you can learn here. So 2080 um, is totally wrong, right? It would be nice if, if the sales amount would be that, that high, but it isn't, right? We already proved this. We saw three, uh, four rows. We, this does not add up to 2080. This only adds up to 670. So what's the problem here? Can anybody guess what's the problem here? Let's show the sales amount question here again. The problem we are having here is that I ask for the sum of the quantity. This is okay, right? We can sum we can sum up quantities, but I also ask for the sum of the price. This is like if you do grocery shopping and you uh, uh, buy pears and you buy apples and you buy like five pears and four apples, and then you take okay, it's five and four, it's nine, and then you take the price of the apple plus the price of the uh, 
of the pairs and add them up and then you multiply this by nine. This is wrong, right? What we need to do is that we have to multiply the quantity of the apples with the price of the apples and the quantity of the pairs with the price of the pairs. We cannot just sum up those individually and then do the multiplication. So that's wrong. There's a problem here. So every time you do multiplications in your measures, stop for a moment and remember and try to find out, is this the right thing? Can I really sum up the quantity? Yes, I can do. But does it make sense to sum up a price? No, the price is non-additive. We're not allowed to add up prices. This gives an, a, not a meaningful number, right? This is a useless number. So how can we do this? The problem is that we cannot like calculate it with, with the sums, but differently. I think I can jump back to my slides here. So what we need here is that we need to calculate the price of quantity. I mean, this is given. We have the price, we have the quantity to come up with the sales amount. We need to multiply those two. But what we need is that we have to iterate for the full sales table, calculate this for each row, right? But in the report, if somebody asks us to show what's the sales amount, we do not want to use the sum of the price times the sum of the quantity, but we want to sum up those results, the sales amounts, the individual sales amount we calculated. And this is possible with a function called sum x. So sum x, x like iterator, I'm used to say, just to make fun of it. I'm not sure why they used x and not e for iterator, i for iterator. So um, sum x means that it's ex exactly doing what I just described, right? We're iterating over each row. So we have a row context here. Remember, we're still in the, in the measure, but we can have a, a, a row context inside a measure. We have, I didn't put sum of price, I just put price and quantity here because this is done individual by individual rows. And then in the end, everything is summed up. And you might guess, yes, there's a function min x, which would return 20, or a function max x, which would return 500, or a function concatenate x, where you can concatenate a string to one long string, or product x to multiply those values. There's about 10, if I remember correctly, uh, 10 different iterator functions. And this is what we, we should do, right? So instead of having the sums here, we change this and I tell it should be a sum, right? A sum x over my sales table. And in the sales table, I can then calculate the, the price of the sales table without the sum for the quantity. And then the result of my measure will be exactly the same as the as the calculated column because it's actually doing the same thing, right? The calculated column calculated this per column and then the implicit measure with hold power BI, please add up those individual waves, the sum here. And in the measure, I just do it this in the measure, right? I tell it, you know, that you can add up or, or iterate the sales table and will not iterate the full sales table, only the rows available in the current filter context. So for this row, the 1st of Jan uh, September, it two rows are available, right? So it's multiplying individually 10 times 3, 20 times 1, 30 and 20, and then adding those two values up to 50, exactly what we need. So this is the row context inside a filter, uh, uh, inside the measure. That's it something in between with the iterator function, we can ask for row context inside a measure. So every time you do a division, you divide something, you should think of most probably you need a measure for it, right? Every time you do a multiplication, most probably you need some iterator function. If you just add things or subtract things, it's not so important how you do it. This works in, in both worlds, so to speak, right? So this would be one of the takeaways from, from this talk. So how as a, as a DAX author can I also control the filters, right? Usually the, the users, the report user, they click on things and select things and change the filters. How can I as a DAX author control the filters? And I can, right? So I put together a measure called product A, where I ask for please calculate me the sales amount, but I put in this calculate, Function. And this was very mysterious to me in the, in the beginning because I thought calculate, I know English, right? English is not my first language, it's my second language, but I know what calculate means. It's calculating something, right? Uh, and of course, I'm calculating something. Why the heck would I write a DAX formula when I not intend something to, uh, to calculate something, right? So why the heck do I need to wrap something, a calculation, inside a calculate formula? Function. I can just write a calculation without the calculate function. So this was this was something which like 
uh, made my mind work in the beginning. So what is this calculate function? And it turned out it's very powerful. It makes two things, and I only talk about one here, uh, which is that I can provide a parameter. So I have one expression. So the calculator is um, a first parameter for sure, uh, one parameter for sure, which is the expression to evaluate. In this case, it's the sales amount measure to evaluate. And then you can have uh, as many parameters as you want where you uh, write conditions and those conditions they change the filter context. So what we get here is now the question there's, there's two interpretations of this code, right? Either uh, we want to see, uh, we, we will see only for product A, we'll see a value of 30 and the others not because we ask them please only show us something for product A or the other interpretation would be please take the filter context and change it. So ignore whatever the filter context is in the current filter context and replace it by a filter on product A. This means that I would see 30 on all four rows and also the total. Remember, the total is by default not the sum of those values, but the total is like a different filter context with no filter exists on the product uh, on the product name. But then, add, then I add something on the product, uh, a filter on the product description that would see the 30 as well. And there's not so much space for discussion or preference because somebody at Microsoft um, already decided how to implement these things. So we don't have to play any guessing game here. It's the case that calculate with a second parameter, or third parameter with a condition means it's replacing an existing filter on this color. So this is how it is. But this is how so now we can change things. So usually if we show the sales amount, remember the product D would not show up because it has no value, right? But now it shows up because now it has a value. It shows uh, the calculation for product uh, 30. Of course, this case calculation as we see it here is not very useful. I do not want to see all my products showing the, uh, the, the sales amount of product A, of course. But what we can use it for is we can divide things. So we can, for example, divide uh, the, uh, the sales amount uh, from product B by the result of this um, of this calculation here and therefore find out that like B is almost five times bigger than A. So we can relate things and this is very powerful what we can do here with calculate manipulating the current filter context. If you only want to see product A, there's something called keep filters. So I can put the same expression that you have just seen, I put in a, in a function called keep filters. And this means do not replace the filter on the product description, which is the default behavior, but keep the filter. So it will now uh, have like a filter on A and keep this filter on A and add another filter A. So this, this works, right? Product A and filter A works. But if the filter is already B and I add another filter that should be, it, it, so this line tells me it should be B. My uh, calculation tells me it should be A. There's no product which uh, has a description of B and A. So nothing is showing up. And for this, so if you would remove the other, uh, the other columns here, the other measures here, only product A would survive. So with this, we can have like show only a value for product A. But selecting something where I filter down on the product A. So very, very, very powerful what we can do with this calculate function. We cannot only add, the, uh, change the existing filter context, we can also just remove the filter context. So with all, when I write all here, instead of keep filters, I write all on product description, it will remove all the filters on the product description. Again, you can see that we see the 670 here because like the, on this line, there's a filter on product A, but I tell, please remove the filter on the product description, which means I see the same as the total. Again, this is not, not very useful as a number to show here, but what I can do here is that I calculate what is the uh, sales amount of product A in percent compared to the total, right? So we make so and so many percentage with product A, B, C, and D, and so on and so forth, because we can divide these numbers. So again, this, this measure itself is not very useful, but this calculation or this expression is very, very useful to do uh, percentage calculations, because we can reach out in this line, we can reach down, so to speak, to whatever the total shows. Sometimes, or like all the times, all selected is even better because with all, it removes really all my filters. But sometimes maybe people have already selected some of the products. They want to see like certain products, one product, different products. So 
so to speak, that the total is not six and seven in all the cases, but it de depends on what kind of products I'm selecting. And all selected does very similar like all removing the filters, but it's only removing the filters within my visual. It's not removing filters from outside the visual. This is how you, this is the way I remember the all selected here. So usually I would say 95%, 98%, uh, people prefer the old select. And when I speak of people, I mean the record users, right? They That's why we build things. I'm, I'm not building something for myself. I mean, it's very fun to work with Power BI, but I'm getting paid for to build something for somebody else. So I also have to do requirement engineering. What, what do, do they want to see? What's the expectation? If they set the filter or not? How should things change? And then it turns out all selected is what most of the people prefer uh, instead of all four of these kind of, of calculations. And last but not least, we have hopefully learned that the calculated column and the measure are completely different artifacts in our data model. So calculated column, for example, it increases your refresh time and the model size. That means the memory used by your model. It means the, uh, the size, the file size, while a measure is calculated on refresh time and therefore it's not influencing any, it's not persisted in the model. It's not increasing the model size, it's not increasing the file size, it's not increasing the, the memory pressure. You could argue that maybe display, displaying the, the result of a calculated column is faster than the measure, but depending on how complicated the calculation is, the difference might be in milliseconds. So nobody would recognize it. So I try to implement everything as a measure, but only if I'm not so, um, uh, successful enough to increase the performance from the measures, one of the like later tools would be to persist some of the intermediate results as a calculated column. But usually this means that we use more resources, right? And the bigger your file is, uh, the bigger the file is also in the Power BI service. And you know there's a limitation depending on your license uh, model, how big the files can be. And of course, even if you're on premium, uh, the limitation is on like the sum of your models. The more, the bigger your models are, the less models you can use on the same infrastructure. The earlier you need to pay for P1 instead of a P, a P, uh, P2 for instead of a P1, for example. So calculate columns, you can add them in, in, in small tables, like a date table, and to increase the number of, of columns there because it's like four, not, not even 400 rows per, per year. Don't think about it. For bigger tables, be careful with calculated columns, prefer uh, calculations on measures here. The formula that calculate the column is never influenced by filters because calculated column is calculated during the refresh time, way before some, some somebody uh, adds a filter or change a filter in the, in the report. So this is already calculated, so there's no filters applied. A measure is totally reacting to filters because nobody wants to see like the sales amount for all the years and all the products and all whatever. You always have to apply some, some of the filters and measures react to this. For the calculated column, the formula only works in a specific table. If you copy paste the code to another table, it will not work there. Uh, for measure, it's totally independent. You can move it around uh, uh, in, in your model and only depends on where people look for, for the calculation for the measure. Like, do, do you want to see on top of the list or inside your, your fact tables? The calculated column can reference other columns, of course. Um, for measures, we cannot because even if you, if I put the measure inside the sales table, I cannot just refer to the columns in the sales table. I must apply an aggregation function, typically a, a sum or a min or a max in most of the cases. You should not keep the intermediate columns if you do complicated stuff. Please do not keep the intermediate columns because they take up space, right? So in the end, you should like make one big calculation as a column to save on, on those uh, space used otherwise by the intermediate uh, resource in measures, keep all the intermediate, they, they don't take any, any resources. And the implicit measures for calculated columns only work in Power BI. So if you connect with analysis um, uh, with Excel to your Power BI data model, you cannot use those implicit measures. It will tell you, no, this column, you cannot put it into the value portion of your pivot table. With explicit measures, normal measures, this works uh, brilliantly. So this means that I just added in time. I talked fast enough. Are there any questions? There has been one that's coming. I know mm -hmm. you touched on this at the end, but um, what are your tips for debugging DAX and improving DAX performance? Yeah, debugging DAX is, is, uh, is not, not easy. This is the hard part here. So what I usually do is that I first find out uh, 
what kind of measure is like the, really the, 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 the slow one. So what you can use here is starting point would be to turn on, you know, this uh, there's this view. I'm not also confused with the German version. I usually use the English version and there's this performance analyzer and then you can run something here, right? And it will tell you, uh, uh, refresh everything and it will tell you, ah, okay, the sales, this is like the slowest one. I mean, it's really fast, yeah? And then you look there, what kind of, of tax code you have here and then copy this and I usually use uh, I tend to think every, like everybody because like Marco Russo and uh, Alberto Ferrari, the two godfathers of DAX, so to speak, uh, the two Italians, they use DAX Studio for that. Uh, so I put it in there and start then finding out, so what's the mm -hmm. hard part in here? So you can analyze these things in and, 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 and then I comment things out, right? I remove, uh, I comment things out, I comment them in to find out which of my DAX measures is the slowest one and then you can start uh, digging into there. So what, um, what Duck Studio is really good for is that you can also uh, come here and say, okay, maybe the sum of quantity, which is calculate something, the sum quantity is the wrong uh, dimension. No, 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 where's the, where's the right measures? I'm just going up something here. Where, where is it? Where is it? Order by, because this is not a measure, right? I expect a measure here. Uh, but you can then add the definition of this measure to your query. So you can then rewrite. So maybe I replace this with my, with my measure here, right? 